comments on Ezekiel chapter 1. Glorious revelations during darkest days. All who serve God with purity of soul will know that he is jealous that his honor should be preserved. Many of the most glorious revelations recorded in the Bible were made by the Lord in the darkest days of the church's history. The Lord has given these revelations of his glory in order that men may be deeply impressed regarding the sacredness of his service. Impressions have been made that should bear with solemn force on the mind, showing that God is God and that he has not lost his glory. He requires the utmost fidelity in his service today. The impression must be left on human minds that the Lord God is holy and that he will vindicate his glory. Manuscript 81, 1906. Verse 8. Divine power gives success. In Ezekiel's vision, God had his hand beneath the wings of the cherubim. This is to teach his servants that it is divine power that gives them success. He will work with them if they will put away iniquity and become pure in heart and life. The heavenly messenger seen by Ezekiel like a bright light going among the living creatures with the swiftness of lightning represent the speed with which this work will finally go forward to completion. He who slumbers not, who is continually at work for the accomplishment of his designs, can carry forward his great work harmoniously. That which appears to finite minds entangled and complicated, the Lord's hand can keep in perfect order. He can devise ways and means to thwart the purposes of wicked counselors and those who plot out mischief. Those who are called to responsible positions in the work of God often feel that they are carrying heavy burdens when they may have the satisfaction of knowing that Jesus carries them all. We permit ourselves to feel altogether too much care, trouble, and perplexity in the Lord's work. We need to trust him, believe in him, and go forward. The tireless vigilance of the heavenly messengers, their unceasing employment in their ministry in connection with the beings of earth, show us how God's hand is guiding the wheel within a wheel. The divine instructor is saying to every actor in his work, as he said to Cyrus of old, I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. Review and Herald, January 11, 1887, verses 25 to 28. Individual freedom, yet complete harmony. God is acquainted with every man. Could our eyes be opened, we would see that eternal justice is at work in our world. A powerful influence not under man's control is working. Man may fancy that he is directing matters, but there are higher than human influences at work. The servants of God know that he is working to counteract Satan's plans. Those who know not God cannot comprehend his movements. There is at work a wheel within a wheel. Apparently the complication of machinery is so intricate that man can see only a complete entanglement, but the divine hand as seen by the prophet Ezekiel is placed upon the wheels and every part moves in complete harmony, each doing his specified work and yet with individual freedom of action. Manuscript 13, 1898. Chapter 9, verses 2 to 4. A mark which angels read. What is the seal of the living God which is placed in the forwards of his people? It is a mark which which angels but not human eyes can read, for the destroying angel must set his mark of redemption. Letter 126, 1898. The angel with the writer's inkhorn is to place a mark upon the forwards of all who are separated from sin and sinners and the destroying angel follows this angel. Letter 12, 1886. Seal is a settling into the truth. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Indeed, it has already begun. The judgments of God are now upon the land to give us warning that we may know what is coming. Manuscript 173, 1902. Chapter 16, verse 49. No imitation. The prophet Ezekiel describes a class whose example Christians should not imitate. 
Ezekiel 16:49 quoted, We are not ignorant of the fall of Sodom because of the corruption of its inhabitants. The prophet has here specified the particular evils which led to dissolute morals. We see the very sins now existing in the world which were in Sodom and which brought upon her the wrath of God even to her utter destruction. Chapter 20, verses 12 and 13. Contempt for law shows contempt for lawgiver. Those who trample upon God's authority and show open contempt to the law given in such grandeur at Sinai virtually despise the lawgiver, the great Jehovah. By transgressing the law which God had given in such majesty and amid glory which was unapproachable, the people showed open contempt for the great lawgiver, and death was a penalty. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, pages 294 and 300. Chapter 28, verses 1 to 26. This history, a perpetual safeguard. Ezekiel 28, 1 to 26, quoted, The first sinner was one whom God had greatly exalted. He is represented under the figure of the prince of Tyrus, flourishing in might and magnificence. Little by little, Satan came to indulge the desire for self-exaltation. The scripture says, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Thou hast said in thine heart, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. Though all his glory was from God, this mighty angel came to regard it as pertaining to himself. Not content with his position, though honored above the heavenly host, he ventured to covet homage due alone to the Creator. Instead of seeking to make God supreme in the affections and allegiance of all created beings, it was his endeavor to secure their service and loyalty to himself, and coveting the glory with which the infant father had invested his son, this prince of angels aspired to power that was the prerogative of Christ alone. To the very close of the controversy in heaven, the great usurper continued to justify himself when it was announced that with all his sympathizers he must be expelled from the abodes of bliss. Then the rebel leader boldly avowed his contempt for the Creator's law. He denounced the divine statutes as a restriction of their liberty and declared that it was his purpose to secure the abolition of law. With one accord, Satan and his hosts through the blame of their rebellion wholly upon Christ, declaring that if they had not been reproved, they would never have rebelled. Satan's rebellion was to be a lesson to the universe through all coming ages, a perpetual testimony to the nature and terrible results of sin, the working out of Satan's rule, its effects upon both men and angels would show what must be the fruit of setting aside the divine authority. It would testify that with the existence of God's government and his law is bound up the well-being of all the creatures he has made. Thus the history of this terrible experiment of rebellion was to be a perpetual safeguard to all holy intelligences to prevent them from being deceived as to the nature of transgression to save them from committing sin and suffering its punishment. At any moment, God can withdraw from the impenitent the tokens of his wonderful mercy and love. Oh, that human agencies might consider what will be the sure result of their ingratitude to him and of their disregard of the infinite gift of Christ to our world. If they continue to love transgression more than obedience, the present blessings and the great mercy of God that they now enjoy but do not appreciate will finally become the occasion of their eternal ruin. When it is too late for them to see and to understand that which they have slighted as a thing of naught, they will know what it means to be without God, without hope. Then they will realize what they have lost by choosing to be disloyal to God and to stand in rebellion to his commandments. Manuscript 125, 1907. A general movement represented. I ask our people to study the 28th chapter of Ezekiel the representation here made, while it refers primarily to Lucifer, the fallen angel, has yet a broader significance. Not one being, but a general movement is described, and one that we shall witness. A faithful study of this chapter should lead those who are seeking for truth to walk in all the light that God has given to his people, 
lest they be deceived by the tes- deceptions of these last days. Special Testimonies, Series B, number 17, page 30. Verses 2 and 6 to 10, soon to be fulfilled. Second Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8, and Ezekiel 28, 2 and 6 to 10 quoted. The time is fast approaching when this scripture will be fulfilled. The world and the professedly Christ- Protestant churches are in this our day taking sides with a man of sin. The great issue that is coming will be on the seventh day Sabbath. Review and Herald, April 19, 1898, verse 12. Lucifer as near as possible like God. Evil originated with Lucifer who rebelled against the government of God. Before his fall, he was a covering cherub distinguished by his excellence. God made him good and beautiful as near as possible like himself. Review and Herald, September 24, 1901, verses 12 to 15. Why God could do no more. Satan, the chief of the fallen angels, once had an exalted position in heaven. He was next in honor to Christ. The knowledge which he, as well as the angels who fell with him, had of the character of God, of his goodness, his wisdom, mercy, and excellent glory made their guilt unpardonable. There was no possible hope for the redemption of those who had witnessed and enjoyed the inexpressible glory of heaven and had seen the terrible majesty of God. And in presence of all this glory had rebelled against him. There were no new and wonderful exhibitions of God's exalted power that could impress them so deeply as those they had already experienced. If they could rebel in the very presence of glory inexpressible, they could not be placed in a more favorable condition to be proved. There was no reserve force of power, nor were there any greater heights and depths of infinite glory to overpower their jealous doubts and rebellious murmuring. Redemption, the Temptation of Christ, pages 18 and 19. Verses 15 to 19, Satan's corrupt working. There is a grand rebellion in the earthly universe. Is there not a great leader of that rebellion? Is not Satan the life and soul of every species of rebellion which he himself has instigated? Is he not the first great apostate from God? A rebellion exists. Lucifer revolted from his allegiance and makes war on the divine government. Christ is appointed to put down the rebellion. He makes this world his battlefield. He stands at the head of the human family. He clothes his divinity with humanity, and he passes over the ground where Adam fell and endures all the assaults of Satan's temptations, but he does not yield in a single instance. The salvation of a world is at stake. He resisted the arch-deceiver. In behalf of man, he must conquer as a man, and in the very same manner, man must conquer by it is written. His own words under the guise of humanity would be misjudged, misinterpreted, falsified. His own words spoken as the divine Son of God could not be falsified. It will be in the last great day when every case receives as his works have been, it will be the final and eternal condemnation of the devil and all his sympathizers and all who have served under his jurisdiction and have identified themselves with him. Will he have a reason to assign for his rebellion? When the judge of all the world demands, why have you done thus? What reason can he assign? That What cause can he plead? Bear in mind, every tongue is silent. Every tongue that has been so ready to speak evil so ready to accuse, so ready to utter words of recrimination and falsehood is stopped, and the whole world of rebellion stands speechless before God. Their tongues cleave to the roof of their mouth. The place where sin entered can be specified. Thou wast perfect in thy ways till iniquity was found in thee. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. All this was the gift of God. God was not chargeable with this, making the covering chair beautiful, noble, and good. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Thou hast defiled the sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. In this place, traffic is the emblem of corrupt administration. It denotes the bringing of self-seeking into spiritual offices, 
Nothing in spiritual service is acceptable to God except the purposes and works that are for the good of the universe. To do good to others will redound to the glory of God. The principles of Satan's working in heaven are the same principles by which he works through human agents in this world. It is through these corrupting principles that every earthly empire and the churches have been increasingly corrupted. It is by the working out of these principles that Satan deceives and corrupts the whole world from the beginning to the ending. He is continuing this same policy working originally begun in the heavenly universe. He is energizing the whole world with his violence with which he corrupted the world in the days of Noah. Letter 156, 1897. Chapter 33, Personal Responsibility. The 33rd chapter of Ezekiel shows that God's government is a government of personal responsibility. Each one must stand for himself. No one can obey for his neighbor. No one is excused for neglecting his duty because of a similar neglect on the part of his neighbor. Letter 62, 1900. A voice of warning needed. The 33rd chapter of Ezekiel is an outline of the work that God approves. Those in positions of sacred trust, those honored of God by being appointed to stand as watchmen on the walls of Zion are in every respect to be all that is embraced in the meaning of the word watchman. They are to be ever on guard against the dangers threatening the spiritual life and health and prosperity of God's heritage. Upon us as ministers, God has placed a burden of solemn responsibility. God has declared to us, ye are the salt of the earth. The preserving influence that we may exert in the world is bestowed upon us by the Lord. The bounties that we constantly receive from him are to flow through hand and heart to those around us who have not yet become connected with the fountain head. When we see God dishonored, we ought not to remain quiet, but should do and say all that we can to lead others to see that the God of heaven is not to be thought of as a common man, but as the infinite one, the one worthy of man's highest reverence. Let us present God's word in its purity and lift up the voice in warning against everything that would dishonor our Heavenly Father. Manuscript 165, 1902. Verse, chapter 34, verse 2, a charge to ministers. Upon the ministers of God rests a solemn, serious charge. They will be called to a strict account for the manner in which they have discharged their responsibility. If they do not tell the people of the binding claims of God's law, if they do not preach the word with clearness but confuse the minds of the people by their own interpretations, they are shepherds who feed themselves but neglect to feed the flock. They make of none effect the law of Jehovah, and souls perish because of their unfaithfulness. The blood of these souls will be upon their heads. God will call them to account for their unfaithfulness, but this will in no wise excuse those who listened to the sophistry of men discarding the word of God. God's law is a transcript of his character, and his word is not yea and nay, but yea and amen. Letter 162, 1900. Chapter 36, verses 25 and 26. The sign of the new heart, Ezekiel 26, 36, 26, quoted. The youth especially stumble over this phrase, a new heart. They do not know what it means. They look for a special change to take place in their feelings. This they term conversion. Over this error, thousands have stumbled to ruin, notwithstanding the expression, you must be born again. Satan leads people to think that because they have felt a rapture of feeling that they are converted, but their experience does not change. Their actions are the same as before. Their lives show no good fruit. They pray often and long and are constantly referring to the feelings they had at such and such a time, but they do not live the new life. They are deceived. Their experience goes no deeper than feeling. They build upon the sand, and when adverse winds come, their home is swept away. When Jesus speaks of the new heart, he means the mind, the life, the whole being. To have a change of heart is to withdraw the affections from the world and fasten them upon Christ. To have a new heart, to have a new mind, new purposes, new motives. What is the sign of a new heart? A changed life. There is a daily, hourly dying to selfishness and pride. Use Instructor, September 26, 
1901, verse 26, how the new heart is kept. One of the most earnest prayers recorded in the Word of God is that of David when he pled, Create in me a clean heart, O God. God's response to such a prayer is, A new heart will I give you. This is a work that no finite man can do. Men and women are to begin at the beginning, seeking God most earnestly for a true Christian experience. They are to feel the creative power of the Holy Spirit. They are to receive the new heart that is kept soft and tender by the grace of heaven. The selfish heart is to be cleansed from the soul. They are to labor earnestly and with humility of heart, each one looking to Jesus for guidance and encouragement. Thus the building, fitly framed together, will grow into a holy temple in the Lord. Letter 224, 1907. Chapter 17, verses 1 to 10. What can man's power do? At one time the prophet Ezekiel was in vision, set down in the midst of a large valley. Before him lay a dismal scene. Throughout its whole extent, the valley was covered with the bones of the dead. The question was asked, Son of man, can these bones live? The prophet replied, O Lord God, thou knowest. What could the might and power of man accomplish with these dead bones? The prophet could see no hope of life being imparted to them. But as he looked, the power of God began to work. The scattered bones were shaken and began to come together, bone to his bone, and were bound together by sinews. They were covered with flesh. And as the Lord breathed upon the bodies thus formed, the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet an exceeding great army. Manuscript 85, 1903. A vision of our work. The souls of those whom we desire to save are like the representation which Ezekiel saw in vision, a valley of dry bones. They are dead in trespasses and sins, but God would have us deal with them as though they were living. Were the question put to us, Son of man, can these bones live? Our answer would be only the confession of ignorance, O Lord, thou knowest. To all appearance there is nothing to lead us to hope for their restoration. Yet nevertheless, the word of the prophecy must be spoken even to those who are like the dry bones in the valley. We are in no wise to be deterred from fulfilling our commission by the listlessness, the dullness, the lack of spiritual perception in those upon whom the word of God is brought to bear. We are to preach the word of life to those whom we may judge to be as hopeless subjects as though they were in their graves, though they may seem unwilling to hear or to receive the light of truth without questioning or wavering, we are to do our part. We are to repeat to them the message, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. It is not the human agent that is to, be, to inspire with life. The Lord God of Israel will do that part, quickening the lifeless spiritual nature into activity. The breath of the Lord of hosts must enter into the lifeless bodies. In the judgment, when all secrets are laid bare, it will be known that the voice of God spoke through the human agent and aroused the torpid conscience and stirred the lifeless faculties and moved sinners to repentance and contrition and forsaking of sins. It will then be clearly seen that through the human agent, faith in Jesus Christ was imparted to the soul and spiritual life from heaven was breathed upon one who was dead in trespasses and sins, and he was quickened with spiritual life. But not only does this simile of the dry bones apply to the world, but also to those who have been blessed with great light. For they also are like the skeletons of the valley. They have the forms of men, the framework of the body, but they have not spiritual life. But the parable does not leave the dry bones merely knit together into the forms of men, for it is not enough that there is symmetry of limb and feature. The breath of life must vivify the bodies that they may stand upright and spring into activity. These bones represent the house of Israel, the church of God, and the hope of the church is the vivifying influence of the Holy Spirit. The Lord must breathe upon the, holy, upon the dry bones that they may live. The Spirit of God, with its vivifying power, must be in every human agent, that every spiritual muscle and sinew may be in exercise. Without the Holy Spirit, without the breath of God, there is torpidity of conscience, loss of spiritual life. Many who are without spiritual life have their names on the church records, 
but they are not written in the Lamb's book of life. They may be joined to the church, but they are not united to the Lord. They may be diligent in the performance of a certain set of duties and may be regarded as living men, but many are among those who have a name that thou livest and are dead. Unless there is a genuine conversion of the soul to God, unless the vital breath of God quickens the soul to spiritual life, unless the professors of truth are actuated by heaven-born principle, they are not born of the incorruptible seed which liveth and abideth forever. Unless they trust in the righteousness of Christ as their only security, unless they copy his character, labor in his spirit, they are naked, they have not on the robe of his righteousness. The dead are often made to pass for the living, for those who are working out what they term salvation after their own ideas have not God working in them to will and to do of his good pleasure. This class is well represented by the valley of dry bones Ezekiel saw in vision. Review and Herald, January 17, 1893.